call to order a public hearing tonight. We're a little bit late. We were to have convened at 655. I apologize for that. We ran long with our previous meeting. Uh, this is a public hearing to invite public comment in regard to proposed amendments to the Municipal Code, Chapter 253, Floodplain Zoning. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, has issued revised floodplain insurance rate maps to be effective March 16th of 2009, and in conjunction with adoption of those new maps, the City proposes amendments to Chapter 253 to bring it into conformance with minimal floodplain zoning regulations as required by the Wisconsin DNR. Any member of the public that's present here that would like to uh, address the council, be heard on this issue, this is your chance. I'd like to ask you to come forward, come up to the uh, lectern, give your name, and uh, state your comments. Is there anyone here who would like to comment? Anyone like to address the council uh, about the floodplain zoning amendments? One last time, anyone like to speak? Let's close our hearing. Move to close the hearing. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the hearing. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing is closed. With that, we'll call to order our uh, Common Council meeting for January 19th the Hudson Common Council. Will you all please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Nancy, will you call the roll, please? Mayor Knudsen? Here. District 1, Morissette? Here. District 2, Broca? Here. District 3, Bernard? Here. District 4, Wyland? Here. District 5, O'Malley? Here. District 6, Berkeley? Here. Thank you. At this time, we take comments and suggestions from citizens present. Any citizen who would like to address the council, please come forward and uh, you can speak about any item that's not listed on our agenda, items that might have impact on the City of Hudson or come before the Council at a future time. Uh, this would be related to the Carmichael Road project. Go ahead, you can talk about that right now. Okay, well I'm Jerry Bauer, I live at 223 Iverson Circle here in Hudson. Um, I wanted to talk about the Carmichael Road project and uh, bicycle access. Uh, getting along Carmichael Road down to Cooley Trail Road, uh, which is a wonderful road for bicycling and a good way to get in and out of Hudson if you can get to it easily. Uh, I know the county has done a lot of work at that intersection and going northward from the, the intersection. Um, they've made it two lanes wide and that is, <coughs> seems to be fine to me uh, for bicycling. But going south uh, along Carmichael, you still have the problem where you have two lanes merging together and if a bicycle is trying to get down to Cooley Trail Road, um, it seems kind of hazardous to try to do that. And yet there are people who ride their bikes down that way. Um, every once in a while I, I have seen people, and I used to um, until the traffic got too much for me. But um, what I wanted to ask, I had two alternatives to bring up as possibilities, and maybe there's a third alternative too. One costs more than the other. Um, I, you know, thinking that there's a, a, the potential for federal money for projects, and so maybe that, that would uh, be available. Uh, one is, is to make a paved shoulder uh, along Carmichael Road for that last stretch where the pavement's narrowing down until you get to the paved shoulder or that meets with the section of paved so, uh, shoulder that the county has installed um, right close to the, the intersection. And, and that, of course, would cost money to add to the extra pavement. The alternative that I had thought of 
was when you repaint the stripe along the side of the road to start narrowing the lanes and merging the lanes a little bit sooner, a couple hundred feet sooner, and, and that would create a paved shoulder along the side of the road for bicycles. Um, and, and I don't know if that would fit with the state's requirements for the, with the roads, but if it does, it wouldn't cost anything more to create the, uh, a paved bike trail along the road uh, just by repainting the stripe. And the third and probably safest alternative is to have a completely separate trail, maybe from Albert Street intersection with uh, Carmichael uh, off, off the road completely. But there again, it might not be possible to find a route for that. So I just wanted to, the city to think about what are the possibilities there and, and could you do something to uh, provide access for people riding south to get to Cooley Trail. Thank you. We'll take that item up under our finance committee agenda. And if you'd like to stay, um, and there may be questions for you at sure. that time, feel free to stay and, and be available. Um, but I wanted to let you speak now so that you don't have to sit around <laughs> if you don't want to. Yeah, well, you know, it's actually kind of interesting. I don't come here very often, but you learn a little bit about the city too. <laughs> Good, thanks. Uh, with that, the next, was there any other citizen, anyone else want to speak on any other item? Okay, then would you please read the consent agenda items? To approve the regular meeting minutes of January 5th, 2009, to approve claims for payment in the amount of $977,081.94. A detailed description is available in the clerk's office on request. To approve the issuance of an amusement device operator's license and amusement device permits to Scott Furlong doing business as Leisure Entertainment RW LLC for the period January 20th, 2009 through June 30th, 2009. To approve the issuance of a secondhand jewelry dealer's license to Robert W. Madsen doing business as Elizabeth's Fine Jewelry at 2117 Cooley Road, Hudson, Wisconsin. To approve the public works service charge rates for 2009 as submitted. To approve the issuance of a secondhand dealer's license to Jasha D. Dykeman Smith doing business as LaCroix Consignment at 408 2nd Street, Hudson, Wisconsin. To approve the request for the multiple sclerosis walk to be held June 3rd, 2009 at 8 a.m. to noon, beginning and ending at the high school parking lot on Vine Street. To approve the request from St. Croix County Little League <coughs> to schedule pond hockey games February 6th, 7th, and 8th, 2009 in conjunction with the hot air affair event. Will you please pull that one? To place on file the quarterly reports of the public works director, wastewater director, and fire department. That is all. All right, we remove the pond hockey. Mm -hmm. uh, the others are on the consent agenda. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, roll call vote. Morissette? Yes. O'Malley? Yes. Wyland? Yes. Virchel? Yes. Bernard? Yes. Brokaw? Yes. Consent agenda is approved. We'll take up the pond hockey under uh, public safety mm -hmm. a little bit later. With that, let's move on to the plan commission. Denny Darnold's here. First item, uh, conditional use permit application to place an additional 72 square feet of signage on the freestanding sign at Plaza 94 Shopping Center, application by Krauss Anderson. Planning Commission recommendation is to approve the conditional use permit for the additional 72 square feet of signage at the Plaza 94 Shopping Center. Um, there was some express uh, expression at the Planning Commission meeting that uh, the center itself has evolved from having two major anchor stores to a number of uh, slightly smaller stores and the need for additional signage. Uh, the amount, this amount of signage would put them in par with Banterra uh, commercial area and also with um, the recent sign adjustments that we made for County Market and the Home Depot. So 
this request in itself is not out of order from uh, previous considerations. Denny, would you review for the council uh, what the sign ordinance says for the maximum size currently and what this sign is Certainly. before the change and after the change? Certainly. The um, current sign ordinance says uh, allows signing up to 35 feet high, and excuse me, 45 feet high with a maximum of 135 square feet. The ordinance does also allow through a conditional use permit to consider allowing signs to be enlarged. The current sign uh, at Plaza 94 is uh, 196 square feet and 48 feet high. At the time that sign was approved, uh, there was an allowance to have signage up to 50 feet high and a four to one ratio of square, square feet to uh, height. And that's the reason they're at that standard uh, under a previous uh, approval consideration and again through a conditional use permit a business or group of businesses uh, can apply for additional signage or going higher than the permitted 35 square feet or 35 feet in height excuse me move to approve the request from Carl Sanderson <coughs> excuse me the uh, request from Carl Sanderson for additional 72 square feet of signage on the freestanding sign conditional upon Krauss Anderson removing any signs that are uh, uh, in the uh, city right of way uh, in the front of Plaza 94. Second. Mr. Mayor, I'll recuse myself. We have a motion and the motion is approval contingent on the applicant removing any signs they have in the city right of way. Mr. Morissette's recused. Any discussion? Any, are there any other signs there? Well, I, I just want to make a clarification. Here's the signage for the for the farmer's market there. I'm assuming you don't want that removed necessarily. Um, oh. The uh, businesses were um, advised by Krauss Anderson that they're uh, running against their private covenants with some of the banner signs and so mm -hmm. forth. So uh, Krauss Anderson has asked them, sent out information, asked them to remove those signs. And so there shouldn't be any more banner signs showing up on their private property along the right of way. Okay. Then we won't have to worry about the contingency. Yeah. Okay. We, have, we have discussed the banner sign issue at the plan commission and we discussed whether we should um, consider amending our ordinance. Currently my direction to Danny Darnold is to enforce our current ordinance. We've been working on it. Uh, we sent out letters. We've gotten a lot of voluntary compliance. I could show you photographs uh, that I took in the fall and, and the changes that we've made. I'd say a third went down. And there's, they continue to pop up. Banner signs are one of the most economical ways and the technology changed since we last revised our sign ordinance when it said you can't do banners. Banners became very easily, readily available, and uh, it's hard. People just think they can do it, and so they do it. And uh, it's a struggle, but uh, Denny's been working on enforcement and put some effort into enforcement. So I, I, I'm definitely sympathetic to what you're getting at there if you're talking about those banner signs. Uh, the, the grand opening type banner signs, there's some leeway because you get to do something. Um, um, you're allowed to do something for a grand opening for a short period of time. What has started to happen is um, restaurant special signs. It'll be like a, you know, a, a $5.99 lunch special, a two-for-one special. And once one restaurant started doing it, they all started doing it. Pretty soon we had banners for that particular thing that popped up everywhere. And they're all wrong. Further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Denny, the <coughs> next item is also from the Plan Commission. This is uh, final development plans for the building at 3001 Harvey Street. 
The um, final development plans for at uh, 65,115 square foot industrial building at 3000 Harvey Street proposed by Dean Hansen and Cedar Falls Building Systems Incorporated. Planning Commission recommends approval of the development plans with the following three items of, of uh, condition. Plans to be amended to address the concerns expressed in the letter by Chuck Schwartz, city engineer dated 1-8-2009 with the grades of the driveway to be a minimum of 1% with the developer to try to achieve a minimum grade of 1.5%. The upper retaining wall to be lowered to achieve a less steep slope between the proposed retaining walls with Mr. Hanson provide a letter to the city indicating grants permission for the grading to be entered, extended into his lot to the west. And a letter of credit for the amount of $8,250 be provided to assure the restoration of disturbed areas and ex uh, inspections. Uh, they have agreed to the first two points. The plans have been changed. Uh, Chuck Schwartz has uh, reviewed the uh, amended plans. Uh, the letter from Mr. Hansen and the letter of credit for $8,250 would be, uh, should be submitted to us at the time they apply for the building permit. Uh, Planning Commission recommends approval of those conditions. Um, Mr. Um, Tom Hubbard from Cedar Falls uh, Building Systems is here tonight if you would like for him to answer any particular questions for you. Uh, I recommend approval. Uh, move to approve with the three contingencies that Denny has just mentioned. I'll so second. Motion and a second to approve with the contingencies. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion carries. Thank you. The third item from the Plan Commission is development plans for Market Green and the Harmony Green Heritage slash Heritage Market Heritage <coughs> Greens planned residential development, TV and H Properties LLC. Plan Commission recommendation is to approve the development plans for Market Green and Harmony Green with the following conditions. The plans be modified, that the plans, if modified, are resubmitted to the City Community Development Director to determine the degree of change as proposed and if City re-review or approval is required. The reason that uh, contingency is in there <laughs> within their uh, specifications, they uh, stated that plans can be amended. It's very typical in landscape plans, but I'm concerned about the potential degree of change. If the degree of change is not great, then it's, it's not an issue. The market green be completed <coughs> prior to July 1, 2009, or if it appears that the improvements proposed for market green cannot be completed before that date, that the TV&H properties must request an extension. Again, that provision of July 1, 2009 was a condition of the certified survey map approval last August by the Common Council. At cost estimates for Market Green be submitted based on the approved plans to determine if the existing letter of credit will be sufficient to assure completion of proposed improvements in accordance with the approved development plans. Again, we, re we received a, a letter of credit uh, previously, uh, but these plans are a little more detailed. I just want to assure that we are covered under the letter of credit. The Planning Commission recommends approval of those conditions. I'll move to approve under committee recommendation three bullet points. Motions to approve. Second. Second. Mr. Second. Mayor, I will recuse myself. Mr. O'Malley recuses himself. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Thank you, Denny. Motion carries. And that finishes the plan commission items. We'll move on to the finance committee. Uh, we had an application for an operator's license. Excuse myself. Mr. Morissette recuses himself. The application was from uh, Dylan B. Martinez for the period of January 20th this year to June 30th, 2010. Staff recommendation and the Finance Committee recommendation is for approval. 
I move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The uh, license is approved. Next item is uh, consider the Public Works Department purchase of pre-wedding equipment for roads. This item was in our uh, capital purchase budget. Uh, these items have been, uh, the staff recommendation is to purchase one 3,000 gallon tank and pumping system from Veritech Industries in the amount of $5,645.60 and to purchase from Chris Steele Truck Equipment two 100 gallon tailgate mounted pre-wet units for $5,944.50 and to purchase three 35 gallon frame mounted pre-wetting units for $12,526.71 for a total cost $24,116.81. That is just under the 25,000 that we budgeted for this. However, you'll note that we will only equip five trucks instead of six because we couldn't make it to the sixth truck. Uh, Public Works Department has discussed this and is in favor of it. The Finance Committee recommends that we go forward with it. Move for approval. We have a motion second. and a second to approve. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried. We'll purchase that equipment. Next item is Item number eight, issues regarding possible lawn mowing contracts. The Finance Committee discussed this, is in favor of going forward with it. We decided to uh, break it up a little bit further <coughs> from what you've got in front of you. So let me give you just a little brief background on what we did and this will be back before us again at our next meeting. You've got a draft copy of, uh, of a bid package for grass cutting before you. There are three main areas that we are mowing currently. One is our city parks, one is road right-of-ways, another is trails and walking paths, and then around our public buildings. Um, we intend to ask for bids on each of those um, separately as a separate piece but we also talked about breaking up the city parks into some smaller groupings and that'll be done through some staff work and come back so rather than just asking someone to bid on mowing all the city parks for the season that I think we'll break that up into maybe three parcels where you could bid on one-third of them another different one-third so on or the whole package. The second part was that it'll, the contract and the, the process will have some legal review. And um, does anyone here have uh, further comments on that? Uh, the Finance Committee motion was to bring this back to the next meeting. I just one comment and maybe clarification is making sure that the smaller parks have their weed control done to it. Don't skip that part. Because some of the smaller parks are really looking uh, more yellow than green, if you know, with dandelions and stuff. So I think there's a real need for weed control, fertilization, especially in the smaller parks. Noted. I think it brings up two points, though. Um, one is we've already been bidding uh, for fertilizing. That's already been subcontracted. Um, the other is that there's been a movement, there, there is a movement of people that, uh, let's just say weed control is more controversial than it used to be. I understand that. There are those who feel that we should do it organically instead of with the typical herbicidal uh, sprays and granules. There are those who feel we should do nothing. Um, there is a sustainability movement that says you should, you know, allow absolutely nothing to go into the groundwater or potentially into the river. And so that's an item that 
You know, I think our parks, uh, park board might want to be discussing that, and the public works committee might want to be discussing and take a view of, you know, do not just who's going to do it and what's it going to cost, but what's our strategy and what are we going to do. And I agree with you, but uh, some of those parks looked really bad, and I did get complaints from constituents in District 1, so. Yeah. Well, I can explain that if you like. Go ahead. I think it's. We, we are sensitive to the ecology here, and a, particularly any runoff down to the river. Right. We do broadleaf control only in the month of May, except for a few select areas, such as uh, a couple of spots in, uh, in Lakefront Park and around the municipal building on 4th Street and City Hall. Otherwise, we don't do a lot of weed killing okay. because it's controversial. Well, just to know it. Just, it, you know, I will say again, weeds are a social concept only. Sure. Grass is just another problem. However, I do do, I still want to see it addressed in the most yep. sensitive and without way. without cutting off your discussion about it, I just, I brought it up myself. We're done. Just enough to note that it's something that might be worth some further discussion. It has been discussed. It's not always as simple as you might think these days. And so, uh, how about on this concept, this draft? It is coming back next time. Anything more here? We do have the opportunity to do manual weed control as well. That's oh. true. Yep. All right. I'm not sure that we even need a motion on this since the motion on no. the finance was to, <laughs> was to bring it back. Uh, with that, then, let's, uh, let's move on. Next item is number nine, applications from Crusader Hockey Incorporated for temporary Class B, Class B retailers licenses to sell beer at 5 Hudson. Crusader hockey games. I would point out <laughs> that we have previously both approved and denied applications from the Hudson Hockey Association for selling beer at the Crusader hockey games, most recently approving a series of dates. This is five different dates by a different nonprofit entity. Um, this there is some precedent for this type of thing happening with, for example, a church applying under different names or different entities. They have um, licenses at the same site, different times under different groups. The Finance Committee voted two to one uh, to recommend approval. You have an issue sheet before you. What's your pleasure? You want to hear from the applicant? I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. And a second. Any discussion? I have one, one thought or comment. Um, it's, as I've said before, it's an interesting approach to getting a seasonal license. So if this is approved, then it would be all right for any organization who wanted a series of licenses to come in and apply, as long as they have a place to cordon off their liquor. It's an interesting concept, because I know there's a number of organizations who would like to have it, at least one I can think of that we denied it to two years ago, saying, no, we can't give you one. But had they thought of this idea, they could have gotten it too. So the decision we make here today will also be seen and thought about by other organizations. So your question to you is, we're not just talking about hockey here, because other people will look at this and say, hey, cool idea. I'm going to do the same thing. And if that's okay, then that's what we want to do. Lori. Um, <clears throat> I guess one thought along that line. We have already set a limit to six per organization per calendar year. Um, I guess I would look at it from the standpoint is if we are going to deny this, I would like to seriously look at our city ordinance because we allow a seasonal license for the uh, softball association or whatever or it is softball association in our city park. So what we're saying is it's okay to have a seasonal liquor license if you're on government property, but it's not okay to have a seasonal license if you're on private property. That's completely incongruent and, you know, I. I I don't see a reason, I guess, for, for denying this at this time. Well, one of, 
Other discussion? One. I think Laurie had an excellent point. I think we should deny this and then uh, review our policy regarding these. Uh, there is an additional question in my mind, and, and Mr. Herschel is here, and I, I do, this is rhetorical. Mr. Herschel, you don't need to answer this, but um, as Catherine, our city attorney, pointed out the last time we discussed this, that the person who applies, the entity that applies for the license must be the person in control of the sale, must be the person who benefits from the proceeds of the sale, that this must be for the applicant, not for a third party. And in the case that you have just mentioned, where a church can and has in the past used different applicant names, but it's one entity, it's the same church. Here we have two different entities. We've had applications that have been approved for Crusader Games by the Hockey Association, and now we have a request for selling beer at Crusader Games by the Crusader Association. My question is that, uh, or I guess my point is that uh, it uh, casts a suspicious light on who's been getting the benefit and who's been making the money if it's two different applicants. Also, uh, conferring with my constituents, they uh, once again have informed me they don't want this to happen and uh, I'm in total concurrence with that. Other comments? I had a request that I work on and have staff work on coming up with some uh, way for us to modify our prohibition against giving licenses to only uh, the regular full bar license to only uh, restaurants. Well, a class B beer, to get a class B beer, you need to also be licensed as a restaurant. Correct. In, in Hudson, that's what we require. Yeah, that's a Hudson requirement, not a state requirement. And, you know, I have not done it. I, I've given it thought. It's a difficult task, and it's, that's basically in limbo. Um, if you have ideas about how to draft such a thing, I know, Alan, you, you've got Well, I, I think our requirement ideas. now is we have to have 50% food. Is More than 50% mm -hmm. food. Yeah. At least 50%. That's how, so, yeah, that's right. the definition of being licensed as a restaurant. Yeah. And, you know, and the question before has come up, well, why, you know, why is this the only way they can go? Well, ma mainly because we've constructed it that way. And for a class B beer. For a class B beer. Um, that said, you know, uh, we, we once upon a time, we said, let's give them an approval for a date or two and see how it goes. Before they even had a chance to report back to us how it went, we denied the next one, I believe. And, but now there have been a few. And um, have you heard negative feedback? No, that, that's the thing is, I mean, there was media and press saying, what, what in the world are they doing? But, uh, you know, I'm, I have not heard that there have been anything negative uh, associated with that, this, these temporary licenses. There was an article in St. Paul Pioneer Press that was negative to this. The article was negative? Yeah. Or the, there was an incident they were reporting? No, the, the article was negative. You were talking about press the, the uh, mentions. And there, there has been press mention yeah. of this. In, yeah. But it's not about a police incident or anything that occurred. No, the, I, I think there's there's a misunderstanding that that were that I think there was a misunderstanding about what was going on. That the fact that it sounds as though you're you've got beer at a youth event. Gee, it sure does, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, because all the people playing are between 16 and 20. Exactly. I mean, that's the misunderstanding. I would call those youths. Yep, and it's no different than when you go to our booster days and we've got the, the carnival going round and round and you've got a beer garden. Or Pepper Fest when you've got the kids running and having a family event and you've got the beer garden. I mean, this is Wisconsin. This happens in every community at almost every community event, whether it's at St. Patrick's Church in the summertime or uh, Lakefront Park when we do events down there. It's, uh, this is uh, part of our culture, and part of our licensing obligation is we need to have a valid reason to be saying no to someone. 
And yeah, I think you start with a default position of people ought to be able to do what they're going to do unless you have a reason to say no to them. And so my question is, what is our reason to say no to them? We've covered this before. Any further discussion? I just, just to say, you know, I don't feel comfortable denying it because of our inconsistent policies, you know. So I think it's on us to straighten ourselves out in the future and not to punish a good organization for what they're trying to do. And I believe me, I was the first one to object to this. And I admit it's not consistent. Uh, Randy, I, and I would like to comment that my vote is no reflection at all on the Crusader Hockey organization. No. And, and I don't think a no vote here to say we don't want to do this in Hudson is a reflection on the, all the other communities in the Crusaders League who are allowing this and across Wisconsin and Minnesota where it's happening. That doesn't mean that we're crazy to be the ones who say no, we won't allow it. So you could go either way. It's a close call. That's what we're about here. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. No. Four to two, motion carries. Next item, applications, or pardon me, consider increasing building and zoning fees. The Finance Committee recommended that we go forward, construct a ordinance to implement the uh, fee increases. These, these fees have not been increased in a number of years since at least uh, the year 2000. Um, they're moderate. They'll be back on a future agenda. Anyone have any comments about that before we send that to staff to turn it into an ordinance? I'm not sure we need a motion on that either. Next item, number 12, approve plans and authorize bonus row to advertise for <laughs> bids for Carmichael Road Mill and Overlay Project. This is our major road construction project for the 2009 summer construction season. We're trying to get an early start on it. We've tried to do a couple of things a little bit differently with this. Uh, one was to do some measurement and pre-work on it back last year. Um, it has long been our intention to uh, to do this this year in the in the planning process. <coughs> our budget has in it uh, approximately two million dollars of capital bonding this year. I hope that we can use as little of that two million to do this project so that there's as much of that two million left to do other projects. It's my fervent hope that the oil, the cost of a barrel of oil this year being $38 last week helps a lot since last year the cost was about 140 when we were bidding. So we're trying to move this up. Um, and uh, I think it's on track to be quite early in the year. The question came up earlier tonight was, you know, at what point do you want to talk about those other projects? And at what point do we want to come back and sell the bonds? And I think the first step in that is find out what they'll do this job for. And so we've got to get it out there and get some bids in. So Chuck, you've got a presentation for the council. Yes. Thank you, Mayor. Council. Sure. Paul, to put it up, please. Instead of showing your face, <laughs> we're going to show a map of the project. And you can see it's oriented with north being to the right. It's a little bit of a non-traditional uh, way to draw a map, but it works better. It's a long, wide screen and a long, wide project. North is to the right, south to the south, or south to the left. And uh, go ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, when you authorize to go forward with the plans and specifications in December. Uh, we talked about a three inch mill and overlay from, of Carmichael Road from Cooley, which is just north of the interchange, uh, one and a quarter miles to the south, uh, which is approximately straight across, as you see in the diagram, 
from from the old dog track, 600 feet south of uh, Valley View Drive. And at that time, we talked about a three-inch millen overlay for the in, the entire project with an alternate to go to a two-inch <laughs> millen overlay south of Hanley Road, which sees a significant less amount of traffic, specifically truck traffic. Uh, those pl plans have changed somewhat, and uh, what I'd like to do is walk, walk you through those changes, walk you through the project, talk about a project schedule for you and the TV audience, and, uh, you know, and then we can talk about some other issues that were raised and any other questions that you may have. Uh, starting on the right and moving left on your screen there, you can see the project north of the freeway engine interchange includes a couple hundred feet of Carmichael Road as well as uh, a little finger of the frontage road uh, to the east there that, that the city maintains. And in that area, it's colored blue and, and we're proposing a three and a half inch mill and overlay and an and a E10 pavement, which, which is a very hard pavement um, and uh, because that sees so much traffic, uh, specifically truck traffic. Uh, the reason we went to a three and a half inch as opposed to the three inch has to do with the way Carmichael Road was originally constructed. It was constructed in three one and a half inch layers. And if we were to mill three inches, that would have put us right at the top of, of, that, of that bottom layer. And there's a potential when you do that to, to get uh, very thin sections of, of that middle layer, which you don't want because of the opportunity to kind of break apart. So you, you do want your mill to be within a layer. And so that's why we went slightly deeper in, in, in this area as well as um, subsequent areas to the south, which I'll now talk about. Uh, again, we use three and a half inch mill and E10 pavement for the uh, Crestview Drive area south of the interchange. And then we move into a three and a half inch mill of an of a E3 pavement, which is uh, less expensive and uh, we're not seeing the, the rutting that we're seeing to the north there. And then we move back into a, that harder pavement in the, uh, the Hanley Road interchange area there. And then to the south, as opposed to going to three and a half, we went to two and a half to put it into the middle of, of that second layer. And, and we're proposing that all the way down to the project limits. And it's a little bit difficult to see, but this project scope also includes uh, the, uh, the off-ramp to Elbert Road. So if you're going southbound on Carmichael Road, that, that uh, off-ramp to uh, uh, Elbert Road is included in the project. We are alternate bidding uh, two inches in that green area south of Hanley Road. So at that time, you can consider whether or not you want to proceed with two and a half inches or two inches. Now, as far as the project schedule, uh, you're considering the authorization of bids tonight. We are proposing opening bids February 19th, and that would give the council a first opportunity to award at your March 2nd meeting. Um, again, the way we write these is we give you 60 days to, to consider awarding, so there would be other subsequent meetings that you could consider awarding this project. Uh, we'd likely see this project at the latest starting May 19th after road restrictions have been lifted and, and uh, uh, the, the uh, 2009 construction season is in full force. Uh, substantial completion July 17th with final completion July 24th. Um, How much contingency is in your schedule? Uh, well that that's a very late start date, um, but we do we were giving a month to allow for the uh, the curb removals and uh, some of that upfront work before they actually do the mill and overlay. So we do have a couple weeks of of wiggle room in the uh, in the schedule. Okay. The thought this is a this is a very we anticipate this to be a very good time to be bidding projects. Uh, there's talks of stimulus packages and whatever have you, and, and you know that that could only drive up the cost of bituminous. So I think uh, to get your best price, I would recommend uh, 
advertising for bids at this time. <coughs> now, if if you may, if I may, um, would you talk with us briefly or give some response to the concerns about how we would add bicycle uh, transit paths? Um, there were three potential uh, uh, options that Mr. Bauer brought up. Can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, very good ideas. It's whenever you can accommodate bicyclists. Uh, I, I'm all for that and do recommend that. We do have, uh, there is an eight-foot pathway now that goes down, down and terminates at Albert Road. Well, could Nothing's you, to the so, south there. Okay, so, so for... Just, Orient us to the map where. So on the uh, the west side of the road uh, of Carmichael Road, there there is an there's an eight foot bituminous pathway now that I believe goes all the way to the freeway or up to Crestview. Crestview, Crestview Drive. Yeah. So from Crestview Drive <laughs> southbound there to Albert Road is is where the path currently exists, and then there's nothing south of Albert Road. Um, to Cooley World, where uh, there Cooley appears Church. to be a lot of interest in, in bicycling. And you also have a new school down there as well. Um, it's a very good idea. Uh, one thing, this is a 45 mile an hour road. And in general, uh, you do like to see six to eight feet of, uh, of paved shoulder, so to speak. And so, some of my concern is whether or not we have enough room there. Um, one of the areas, Tom and I briefly talked about this, south of, of Mayor, maybe there's something we can do there that would be economical. Um, you know, we don't want, you know, the trick is from, from Albert Road, they, you know, they can take kind of that, uh, the dog track, uh, access drive and some of those things, but uh, you know, so I don't know how you'd get them from Albert Road up onto Carmichael Road without utilizing the dog track. South of Mayor Road, it does taper down, and I believe I took a quick look at it, but it tapers down to, to 20 feet, 28 feet wide, which if you were to narrow that up to 12 and 12, that only gives you four feet. And, and so that, that's some of the things, and we'd be happy to look at that with, uh, uh, with your staff and, and, and see if there's um, some ways we can accommodate them with doing minimal amount of, uh, of widening. Of course, four feet is better than nothing today when the riding on the road. Yeah, no, well, maybe that's a legal issue, whether or not you want to encourage no, you know, kind of a sure substandard. No, I'm not is, actually. I'm, I'm not sure. positive. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you narrow the lane so much it's unsafe for both the cars and the bicyclists, you might have created a condition where you've been better off to make it uncomfortable enough that they go another route. The but challenge that we did, we did annex and put a school down there. We did have an agreement from a school district that if there were costs associated with that, that they'd work with us on that, and they've done that, the changes of the intersection and the change of the sewer. I'm pretty certain they'd be willing to work with us to get some kind of path, uh, at least for a portion of it. Doesn't it seem as though there should be um, something like the eight-foot path off the road surface? down going along and past the school. Danny, what are your thoughts? Well, you can take the screen down. Well, I, I've advocated, you know, I've advocated an off Carmichael Road path for some time. Basically, at the time the dog track is redeveloped, we would work with that property owner to get it, can you go off of Albert Street on the north side of Carmichael Road, cross underneath the bridge, go onto the dog track property, all the way down to the corner of Carmichael and Cooley Trail. Hopefully at that time we'd have an underpass that'd go under Cooley Trail into the school and then also a side path that'd go onto Cooley Trail. And that's long term. That's not something immediate in 2009 or maybe even 2010. But we don't know that if we could get to, you know, if and when the dog track property is redeveloped, that's the time that we could work to try to get that type of a pathway. We need to segregate that pathway away from Carmichael Road so, so that that Bicycle pedestrian pathway is is totally safe for that type of pedestrian or bicycle traffic. 
the question has been raised about whether this is a pertinent sub subject under the agenda item of the mill and overlay project and I guess I thought it was because if we're going to change these design and bid specs for doing asphalt down there I mean this would be the time to do it we don't want to bid this and then decide that we want to bid something else I mean do you think we should go forward with this right now and leave it to future changes for the bike path would that be your recommendation or do you want us to postpone this to modify it for bike paths what's your professional advice well again and, and Denny may want to weigh into this but I would like to see this thing out for bids and but also at the same time we can start exploring what our options here are and put together some costs and you know whether or not easements would be required and, and, and the like there um, you know that if it's merely just widening and, and adding more shoulder to make it safe you know that we can handle that through bid items and rather easily or you know an addendum uh, to the bid package uh, you know an off-site path you know that gets to be a, a whole different animal with a different set of uh, of uh, circumstances which you know would take some a right. little bit of time to look into council understand the issue mm -hmm. ready for a motion move to uh, authorize BRA to advertise for bids on the proposed Mike Carmichael Road mill and overlay project we have a motion is there a second I'll second any discussion what happens with this request then are we gonna take it up as a separate agenda item well I think that there may be a, a, a another issue to solve first that um, we're talking about mill and overlay of an existing road bed we're not talking about creating new road bed which is much much more expensive and so I think we need to deal with the agenda item here only which is mill and overlay of the existing road bed uh, I believe Denny's uh, suggestion uh, for the safety of the children coming from the school is the really the only one that we should be looking at in the future uh, and again we can't take care of that tonight mm -hmm. Other I, guess, discussion? I guess I just want to point out that this request has been on our books for about two and a half years now yeah. and so I'm surprised that we missed it when this was put together well the cost of creating new roadbed for over a mile would take up our entire two million dollar capital projects budget and maybe then some and just even widening what's there just for as a, as a well you've got a 28 foot road and you're at your you're, you'd be widening it by more than 30 percent that's expensive this project as it stands is probably going to be a million dollars so you're saying it, w it was kind of looked at and taken off the books at that time we don't have the money for it okay. other discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed motion carries next item is uh, in the finance director Betty Caruso uh, prepayment of the remaining principal on the 2.42 million dollar special assessment B bonds series 2001 Betty in 2001 with the development of stage line um, Hammer <coughs> Road phase two and the rock Heiser development in the business park we issued two million four hundred twenty thousand dollars in bonds um, we have made the payments on those with special assessments that have been levied against those properties um, as those properties developed we had them prepay those special assessments with that and with some of the interest earnings over the the period we have enough funds now to make the payment and pay off those bonds I think that's a seven hundred and thirty five thousand dollars in principal outstanding so at the close of this year with the collection of the 2009 assessments um, by March 1st I'll have sufficient funds to pay it so I'm asking council to call for the redemption of the balance of those bond, bonds Do we have to suspend the rules move to suspend the rules second we have a motion to suspend the rules towards adoption of resolution 2-09 <laughs> roll call vote well any discussion before we vote roll call vote roll call yes Bernard. yes Virgil. yes Wyman. yes O'Malley. yes Morissette. yes the motion passes and the rules are suspended Towards Move. adoption of resolution 2 09. Move to adopt resolution number 209. There's a motion to adopt. Second. In a second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. Resolution 209 is adopted.
Next item. Under new business, proposed amendments to the Hudson Municipal Code. Um, oh, Mr. I see Mayor, we've got a safety committee agenda that was taken off the consent agenda. Yes, you're right. I Item number two under the Public Safety Committee uh, agenda is consider the request for pond hockey games to be held on the St. Croix River February 6th, 7th, and 8th, 2009 in conjunction with the Hot Air Affair event. I took it off just because of the uh, location, and I believe uh, Mr. West Sanda has a, a change of location, If not to steal your thunder, but go ahead. <laughs> I do. I'm here. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Wes? You bet. I'm Wes Sanda. I'm with St. Croix County Little League. Um, many of you here are probably familiar with us with our events last year. What we're trying to do is come up with some fundraisers for our kids so we can uh, hopefully go and spend a week somewhere else again this year with the state tournament again. And one of the ideas we came up with was a pond hockey tournament. Um, it's getting to be a pretty big deal around the north part of the country. Uh, spurring a lot of interest, and Hudson doesn't particularly have one. We have had some three-on-threes up at the arena that have also been a pretty good success, so we wanted to explore this one this year, and we thought the Hot Air Fair weekend would be a good weekend to pursue with all the people in town. Uh, the simple part of it, what we discussed at the safety committee, is we were looking for some solid ice to hold this event, and uh, the most solid ice we know on the river, the St. Croix River, is over there by the freeway. Uh, Lauren Morris has suggested we check at the lakefront, and we did do that. The ice is plenty thick there as well to hold the event. We have enough room to carve out virtually as many rinks as we want. So it's, uh, we'd like to have that considered as our primary event location at the lakefront where the beach house is and uh, right on the north side of the divide out going out. And the concern at public safety, Lee, correct me if I'm wrong, was my concern of accessibility down over there by the freeway, crossing on private land, parking on private land, and that stuff as far as the uh, King boat launch. So I suggested checking out behind the bathhouse since we've spent some considerable amount of money down there improving the lakefront. So, Yeah, it's, a, it's definitely our preferred location as well. Centrally located, lots of parking and uh, gives great access for everybody, so that's definitely where we'd like to focus our attention on it. So I'll move for approval. Second. So we have a motion and a second for approval. Now, um, I think public safety is of paramount importance here, and so the issue of choosing where the ice is and where the access points are and so on is, is the main concern. There is a moving water, or the, there's the, the accessory channel that comes and goes under our Walnut Street Bridge. And, you know, so you need to look closely as weather changes. It's not that far away now, so I imagine there's going to be plenty good ice, so it probably won't be an issue. But if you make this an annual event, you know, you won't necessarily be able to do it right there. Right. And that was the concern of public safety is that we know the ice is stable here, but we had said, you know, if you're going to do it there, you've got to make sure because of that, mm -hmm. that uh, mm -hmm. movement. But it is more convenient with more parking up yeah. the other end. And we are fortunate this year, we've had a pretty cold winter thus far, so the, we'd have to have a lot of hot days for it to have any issues we're at either location right now. Uh, were there any staff concerns <coughs> about this? Nope. Sounds like a great idea. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, did I have a motion? Yep. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Good luck with the event. I should mention that Wes was the coach or one of the coaches of the Wisconsin State Champion Little League baseball players this year. What was it? Eight-year-olds? Ten-year-olds. Ten <laughs> And so you're raising money because I heard that reading between the lines, you're planning for a repeat. Absolutely. Yeah, good. <laughs> I like to hear that. Uh, 
All right, now we're going on to new business. Uh, item number 9A, proposed amendments to the Hudson Municipal Code, Chapter 254, flood, 253, Floodplain Zoning Ordinance Number 1 09. Denny Darnold. To a certain degree, this is a housekeeping item. Uh, Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency require, or just uh, established new flood insurance rate maps. We've had the same flood insurance rate map since 1975. So this is an update. Uh, part of the requirement of having the new rate maps, which will go in effect on March 16th, uh, 2009, is that the Department of Natural Resources requires that any floodplain zoning ordinance is brought up to their model code standard. We did that in 2006, so our revision is very minor. Uh, actually, they just came out with a new model in 2008. We had a choice of either going with the old 2006 model ordinance or 2008. I went to 2008 just to bring it up as much as we possibly could get in compliance with the state model ordinance. So the changes are relatively minor. I know you should have had an opportunity to review the changes. Uh, I don't see any concerns of the change. One, maybe perhaps the more significant changes is really the change of datum on how they determine, and that's a, they're going from the 1929 uh, vertical datum to a 1988 vertical datum. There's about a difference of about 2.4 inches, maybe a little less than three inches, which it doesn't make a significant issue, but there may be one or two isolated cases out there where it may. So uh, hopefully uh, we find that it doesn't. Most of our property in the flood way and flood fringe areas is in city land and very little is under private development. So that is it's one nice consideration for having this kind of ordinance. We just don't have to use it that much because most of the areas in the floodways, flood fringe areas are under public ownership by the city of Hudson. I'm uh, Planning Commission, myself, recommend approval. If you may consider, I would respectfully request if you may consider suspending the rules tonight so we can get this adopted by March 16th to be in compliance of FEMA. <laughs> so moved. We have a motion to suspend the rules towards adoption tonight of uh, the Ordinance 109. I'll second. And a second. Any discussion? Roll call vote. O'Malley? Yes. Island? Yes. Morissette? Yes. Bernard? Yes. Virgil? Yes. Broca? Yes. Rules are suspended. Move to uh, approve the proposed amendments to the floodplain zoning chapter 253. We have a motion to Can adopt to ordinance. Uh, Excuse me. 109. I'm sorry. I That's what I that. heard. <laughs> yeah, ordinance 109. Didn't I say that? Sure. I did. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Ordinance 1-09 is, is adopted. Item number B, consider use of paper ballots during the February 17, 2009 primary election, resolution 1-09. Um, we have done this in the past, probably four years ago when we've had a primary that involves just one race rather than all the programming expenses for the actually the two machines not just the AccuVote but also the Hava machine so we would request that you approve this resolution so that we can ask the state for permission to use paper ballots move to suspend the rules second we have a motion and a second to suspend the rules towards adoption of one resolution 109 any discussion roll call vote Morissette? Yes. O'Malley? Yes. Wyland? Yes. Virgil? Yes. Bernard? Yes. Brokaw? Yes. The rules are suspended. Move to adopt resolution number 1-09. Second. There's a motion and a second to adopt resolution 1-09. Any discussion? So how much money does this save us? The programming is what, five, five hundred dollars per machine? Jeez. We still have to use the act. We still have to use the handicap machine, but the AccuVote, the cartridge is about 500 per um, for programming, plus the cost of the ballots, which are a dollar. Yeah, so we're looking three cents. So 
substantial each of the ballots as opposed to running them on a copy machine. So we're probably talking two thousand dollars. Okay. And with we're not uh, anticipating a large turnout, so you know counting those by hand won't be. A, you mean everybody isn't sitting on the edge of their seats to find out about the state super? We always hope we have a big turnout, but historically we have not had a big turnout. The heck you say. Today. Other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion carries and the resolution 109 is adopted. Next item is number C, consider changing the dates of the second council meeting in February. And the first council meeting in April due to election setup conflicts. Both of those um, mornings after the regular scheduled council meeting, we would be having to have some coming early. We traditionally have moved the meetings, so we've offered some dates for both of them. We thought since we were doing February, we'd do April and get it taken care of at this point. So we are looking for some preferences or uh, move to change the dates. For February and April to February 18th and April 1st. Keeping in mind that we know it's April Fool's Day, so we got to be careful. <laughs> so April 18th would be a Tuesday. April 1st would be Wednesday. a Wednesday. Oh, April. April February 18th, isn't it? February 18th is yeah, a Wednesday. Wednesday. Right. And April 1st is a Wednesday. Wednesday. And that will also give us. Nancy, the opportunity to get all the election stuff taken care of the day after instead yep. of trying to rush through that and get everything set up. So, so we have a motion to change the meeting dates to February 18th and April 1st. Was there a second? Second. We have a second. Any discussion? Everyone all right with that? Anyone can't be here because of a prior conflict? Might lead to a quorum problem. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. It's done. Um, we do intend to convene in closed session at the conclusion of our other items here. Um, communications and recommendations of the mayor. The only thing I have to say is um, on Martin Luther King Day, I hope that our country can move towards the point when we pay as much attention to the color of someone's skin as we do their color of their eyes or whether they're left or right handed. I think we're making progress and we need to continue to do that. Any items by the city attorney? City Administrator. Uh, a couple items just to inform the council. The police contracts were signed today, so that is taken care of. All of the year end payroll and HR documentation has been forwarded to the various government agencies. And the employees that are on the HRAs will receive their documentation tomorrow now that we've got everything taken care of. So that is in place and up and operational. So. Any older person? Thank you. Uh, that concludes the regular business at this time. We I'm looking for a motion for us to convene into closed session pursuant to state law 19.05 or 19.851C to discuss 2009 compensation for the city clerk. So moved. <coughs> second. Been moved and second to go into closed session. Any discussion? Roll call vote. <coughs> Morset? Yes. O'Malley? Yes. Oh, Where'd Betty go? I'm sorry. Yeah. Gotta go to Betty. Lyman. Yes. Virtual? Yes. Bernard? Yes. Roll call. Yes. Motion carries. We'll convene in closed session.